Hello, Story Seekers. I'm Nico. I'm Ben, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. Our guest for this episode is a genderpunk and a writer of award-winning odd stories, which have also been nominated three times at the prestigious British Fantasy Awards. Not just that, they also write humorous, if macabre, poetry. And whilst they are English-born, they reside in Switzerland, surrounded by books, effigies of owls, and the great god Ganesh. We would like to warmly welcome Chloe Yates. Hello, Chloe. Hello, my loves. Oh, How are we doing? Delightful. Love it. Pretty well, thank you. Not too bad. A little nervous, I'm not going to lie. But um, it's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, you're very welcome to be here. No <laughs> need to be nervous, but I am going to immediately start grilling you. Why Ganesh? Okay. Um, it's my grandfather's fault. Um, he used to have... <sighs> he died when I was eight, and he was my, my fav- most favourite um, person in the world. Yeah, and so I would listen to all his stories, but he used to often sit in in the middle of our town square as a child with lots of um, Indian and Pakistani kind of grandparents who would they'd sit and t- trade stories and stuff, and he would tell me these stories, and Ganesh was one of his main ones that he used to tell me. So it's just always been my lucky kind of guy. If you see what I mean. I, I do. I, so is this where your love of storytelling came from, do you think? this is? Um, yeah, uh, kind of. Mostly my uh, storytelling and books and stuff is my parents. They're both huge readers of all kinds of stuff, and they've never censored me. Like yeah. when I was a child, oh, but I think the worst one was when <clears throat> I found one that was uh, Philip Jose Farmer short story. I think I was about seven years old, and it was one about – Zombies and, and zombie prostitutes, but that's a whole other story <laughs> of my life. But um, so, yeah, so it comes from them, really. Always been surrounded by books, no matter what. Mm, lovely. I, I've got to say, that threw me back to, uh, to a family. This is an odd story, so buckle in. A family uh-huh. holiday we once took to Florida. And this, uh, this house we stayed in, there was one book on the bookshelf. Oh, yeah. And everyone ended up reading it. Because we'd all taken books with us and we'd read them. And the book we all ended up reading, and this is my father, my stepmother, my grandfather, my cousin, me. We all read this sort of clitorotica book <laughs> about a, a lady getting a job in a new office and the hunky boss. And I think that's a very strange family bonding experience. <laughs> <laughs> very strange. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no filters from the from the owners of the property to leave one yeah, just, just one book for a start, I mean, and then that book in particular is even weirder. I mean, I think it's, it's more strange to own an entire bookshelf and only furnish it with, yeah. some, yeah. with some smut. That's suspect, to be fair. I'd oh, say highly suspect. Like, like all that space and one book about Phil. I reckon they wrote it. You reckon they wrote it? <laughs> they were hoping that you would share it with your friends as well as your family. Which is very silly of them because you're only ever going to sell one copy and the whole world will pass <laughs> it around. <laughs> so that's possible, but it's also possible they, they completely fucked up their timings and they they actually were very quickly scooping up all of their erotica books. All of their erotica arrived, books. <laughs> running out of the back door, leaving only one behind. Oh, smut con. We interrupted the whole thing. Yeah. Somehow that makes me feel really sad, though, because that one forgotten book. Yeah. Just sitting there yearning. So you did a good thing, really, by all reading it, right? Oh, uh, well, you could describe it that way. (laughs) Right. I'm still getting over clitorotica, so (laughs) carry on, boys. So I think we better move on from that. We should tell our own (laughs) stories, I think. Our regular (laughs) listeners know how they go. But for those of you joining us for the first time, there will be three stories told in this episode. All of them have been written to the same shared prompt. This week, the prompt is Susuration. And Ben, you'll be up first. (laughs) Susuration. Valtree wiped tears from his face when he saw the boy wave to his mother. The boy could not speak, nor bear to be touched. Signs of affection from him were scarce. Like a thirsty man on the ocean upon finding a barrel of fresh water, Bowtree drank in that moment, 
and resisted the urge to hug his child. His wife waved in response, desperately raising both hands to prolong the loving moment, as Bowtree pulled the barge out of sight down the Tongue River. Theirs was a holy task, and Bowtree knew it would take them from their secluded home, through the city of Garganeg, and out to the temple forge at Yarak. He had made the journey every week of his life. The giant muscles of his back aided him in his task, and he enjoyed the sensation of his strength warming up. His father and father's mother had been poles for the temple before him. He had grown up on the long barge, watching them age past the point of strength and wit required to navigate the river safely. For himself, he feared that the rapid expansion of Garganek might leave both him and his trade behind, if the Leviathan were not completed soon. The city had grown at an alarming rate during his lifetime. Would-be recolonizers filled the place, all waiting for the next departure to another world through the ancestor's door. Yet they were unable to risk their journey until the next Leviathan was completed. Those enormous holy warriors were necessary to eradicate the demons which had destroyed the ancestors. They were the only way to allow Bowtree's people to reclaim planets long since lost to them. Technology, art and culture had risen in anticipation of the first new world in 30 years. Those people, drawn to the city by lot initially, wondered what their next world would look like, and sought to ready themselves for any exciting possibility. The impatient recolonizers had tried every way they could to speed the construction of their leviathan. The smog of Garganek's industrial district clung to the hairs in his nose as Bowtree pushed his old barge into the docks. Other, sleeker barges also attended the manufactories. In recent years, competitors had sprung up from within the recolonizers to challenge his business with the Temple Forge, and though they could not handle the larger loads, nor complete the journey as quickly as Bowtree, there were far more of them. At least, thought Bowtree, the bright neon signs and electronic music that were popular within the city had not been permitted to spread to the manufactories. Crucibles, bellows, and old-fashioned soldering irons were still as far as technology had been allowed to advance there. The Leviathans, by law, could not interact with any electronic technology before passing through the door. Bowtree did not allow that technology in their home for precisely that reason, and sought to insulate the boy as much as possible. Though he feared the child's school teachers did not enforce his rules, their talk of learning aids, noise-cancelling devices, and computers rankled Bowtree's core. He watched as an enormous contraption was winched aboard his barge by means of a dock crane. Then, working quickly, he secured the precious cargo by lashing it in place before digging his pole into the murky depths of the dock to free the barge from the city's clutches. The Tongue River opened up once past the city, throwing its banks wide, and Bowtree noted that the river's hue had begun to change from dull green to dark yellow. Giant lily pads marked the approach to the Temple Forge. Each of the green leaves splayed wider than he was tall, and their flesh was pronged with sharp thorns, which they used to viciously clear any competitors away. Bowtree, working hard with the added weight of metal on his barge, pushed through the tangle of pads with care. He noted that some of them were damaged, holes torn through them by his competitors' careless poles, no doubt. It began with a soft rustling and the smell of petrichor. The saturation of rain on the river ahead caused the boy to pull up his hood, fiddle with his hair for a moment, and then sit with his feet dangling just above the spiky pads. Bowtree knew he would sit like that until the rain stopped, and thought back to his own youth, how he had scampered up and down the deck, getting under his father's feet, looking for things to learn and help with, how he had begun to take on the pole when the weather worsened each year, and how he'd eventually taken over entirely. That would not be the boy's fate, and the end of his family's tradition filled Bowtree with a melancholy he found hard to ignore. The oblique lines of the temple's architecture gradually emerged through the dense foliage of the far bank. The complex went on for miles, and was crowned with alabaster statues of the leviathans which had been constructed and awoken there. Though he could not see it, Bowtree knew that behind its walls one such leviathan was nearing completion. That consecrated war machine would soon awake to its task when a holy text was placed at its heart. It would be the first through the ancestors' door, and the first to arrive at the new world that the recolonizers inhabiting Garganect longed for. A jetty stuck out amongst the lily pads like a tongue unfurled from the temple's facade, and Bowtree saw a group of priests walk out from their river door to greet him in the rain. 
as his father and grandmother before him had done, he expertly brought his barge to a stop and then fell to his knees on the jetty in supplication as their workmen unloaded the contraption. When that task was done, the lead priest pressed two fingers to Bowtree's forehead and then stepped towards the boy, who had remained sat on the barge's lip, to repeat the blessing. He has no words, Bowtree warned her, then gritted his teeth, expecting his son to wail. Instead, it was the priest who screamed. You desecrate our construction! She pointed at his son, who, having removed his hood, was wearing headphones. Bowtree felt as though his heart had stopped. The woman made to strike the boy, but Bowtree caught her wrist. You dare to touch me! Your child has imperiled the battle for a new world! Blood must be given! Bowtree pushed her, hard. She was flung away and tumbled into a knot with the other priests. Some of them grabbed at him, but Bowtree jumped back aboard the barge and put his weight through the pole. It jerked away from the jetty. He knew that if he could just get them away, the priests would never catch up. Polars are unbeatable on the river. There was a small cry from the other end of the barge, and he looked to see the boy reach for the headphones he had dropped overboard, tip forwards, and fall into one of the huge spiked lily pads. Bowtree had seen men fall in before, and knew the pads would catch and bind their accidental prey, thorns snagging on clothes and skin, until the water of the Tongue River drowned them. He leapt feet first into the disturbed water, and clawed at the pad's flesh. It tore the nails from his fingers to do it, but he found his thrashing boy, and pulled him through the hole he had made. They breached the surface together, the boy caterwauling, and Bowtree gasping for air. The priests pulled them out, and when Bowtree tried to throw them off, one hit him on the back of the head with a wooden club. He awoke alone on his barge. Dusk had fallen on the river, and Bowtree saw that its current had drifted him to the opposite bank. The boy was gone. He got to his feet, feeling unsteady, and leant against the side of his barge. He struggled to focus his eyes, but when he did, he saw that the temple's doors were closed. Wincing, he pulled the spare pole from the belly of the barge and used his damaged hands to guide the vessel back out onto the river, pointing it towards home. The pulsating night lights of Garganek caused pain to throb from the base of his skull as Bowtree pulled slowly past the city. The Tongue River flowed against the keel of his barge as he brought it within sight of his home. The lamps were still on by the door, and by their light, he saw his wife come out to welcome them home. He saw her raise her hand, hesitate, and then saw it drop to her side. Bowtree wept. That was really sad. Oh, man! <laughs> How could you? His feet increased. Oh, dear. Oh, that's, um, yeah, that's, yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a, my nephew is um, uh, about 10 or 11 and he's nonverbal. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, yeah, reminds me of Ozzy. One of the uh, first things I wrote down was neurodivergence, question mark. So, yeah. <clears throat> I like, yeah. I also, I really like stories that have that fantasy, like old, you know, classic kind of fantasy feeling to them and then kind of them mixed in with the sci-fi stuff i really quite like that i mean yeah, I you, were, you were definitely writing for your at least one of your audience members with the giant holy mechs being built to fight the demon hordes <laughs> two <laughs> of them oh yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm glad they're a fellow ad mech with me <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah I, I like it when stories have fantasy and sci-fi or yeah or, or the reverse where you think it's sci-fi and it turns out to be a fantasy this you know these kind of things yeah are, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I love that Religion i really enjoyed it but it was very sad that's, the, that's, um... that's very kind i mean that's that's the kind of feedback i'm looking for so <laughs> it's good stuff <laughs> <laughs> you um so it's a couple of times now you've written stories about uh boat and boatmen boat folk yeah, taking holy journeys is something particularly about that as a theme that you think calls to you. Um, I don't know. I think my my favorite book for a very long time was Heart of Darkness. Yeah. Um, mm. and yeah, these kind of like journeys along overgrown rivers towards mm. some sort of fate. I don't know if they do. I think they probably do speak to me uh, because of that. Um, yeah. and occur to me because of that. Um. Yeah, I, you know, I can't sail or, or, 
or polar barge or anything like that. I guess I also, you know, I have lived in Cambridge for a very long time, and we have yeah. punting here. You know, it's a, mm. it's a big thing to be able to punt the river. Um, but yeah, no, I think it just it sort of flows together really a bit. Yeah. yeah. There's a very nice uh, societal divide you did in there as well, because obviously in a lot of uh, fantasy worlds, you will get the, the slightly more modernised city and then the, the little mm. villages that are a long way behind. And for the that kind of like post-industrial revolution industry to be the backwater stuff, that's a really cool idea. Yeah. They are, we, we've, we've still only got soldering irons out here, as though the idea of solder and circuit boards isn't super advanced. That's, yeah, it's really cool. Well, soldering was initially used to create like sheet metal and stuff um, before it was used on circuit boards. So I think. That I think must it's have been rubbish. It's so weak. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a fair few. I think the Chrysler building in, in uh, New York is made with a. The sheet metal made that way, I think. Oh, cool! It's the facade. Oh, wow. it's, you know the shiny, the shiny facade. Is yeah. The right building there, I think that's the right building. Yes, kind of. Yeah, yeah it kind of fans yeah. out at the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So, I, yeah. It, but but you know, I'm I'm really glad that you connected with the the neurodivergence and the non-verbal character because I, he's not being a very good parent in that story. You know, he's no, he's no. missed the kid no. that this kid has brought technology with him. Um, yeah. Because he doesn't like it. He doesn't. He's not paying attention. He's too wrapped up in his own shit about the tradition of his family and stuff like that to, to actually be paying any proper attention to his to his child. And yeah. Depending on how you read it, that either gets the child killed or abducted by priests, both of which are pretty bad. Yeah. There are that. They do figure quite high on the uh, table of bad parenting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But he 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 just from the off that just there wasn't too much description about the boy because you didn't need it. You gave little punches of things that made us aware that yeah. this wasn't a regular kid. You know, yeah. I liked that. So the uh, there's a lovely line in there that really drove home who the dad was, and it was he didn't think that the teachers were following his rules. <laughs> yeah, this idea yeah. that you would know better than the educators is. I, I've met an awful lot of people like that who would, you know wouldn't take the time to actually consider the needs of their children if they were neurodivergent. So it's a very, hmm. it's a very realized character and done very well. I mean, it's risky to use someone like that who isn't a good person as a protagonist. You've got to be willing to actually let them be shit and you did a good job of it. Mm -hmm. You didn't, you yeah. know, he didn't save his boy and everything was well in the end. It was like, no, yeah. too little, too late. Yeah, no magic uh, fairy dust. Yeah. It was nice. In the big well, pad. <laughs> yeah, I did think for a second that you were going to, ah, oh, the magical pad has arisen and the boy is one with nature and whatnot, but I prefer your ending. That was much better. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's not my style. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah, you've done that. I'd have asked Steph, the my eye. I would have been checking in with you after the podcast. Like, you okay, hey, man? You what, okay, what happened today? You good? It's that meme, that meme, isn't it? It's like, what would you say to make sure people knew that you were in trouble? Oh, yeah. On like, you know, mine, by the way, would be, I love mushrooms. So. <laughs> I really hope nobody dies at the end. <laughs> What's insulin? <laughs> Oh, thanks. That, no, that's um, that's uh, really nice, nice feedback. It's lovely. Yeah, to, I really uh, enjoyed that. that. Much appreciated. I was trying to, I was trying to look for things that I wanted to hate, but I didn't. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I did. I liked the bit where he uh, proper old kung fu slash western style uh, pushed one person back into a group of other people. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie Chan mode. I don't want no trouble. <laughs> Jump back on the boat, barge <laughs> off. That was yeah. I like that. <laughs> I, I think I just had this image of like how strong you would have to be to pole a barge with huge mechanical parts. With mech parts, mech on it. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah with with like finesse as well to to be able to like stop on a dime and this kind of thing. It's you'd have to be yeah. so strong to do oh, that. Yeah. Lad's gonna be big, right? Yeah, gonna big. be big. Big. <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, thank you. And uh, let's we move on. Shall we, uh, Chloe? What have you got in store for us? Oh, it's a story called Saceration, of course. Let's do it. <laughs> Fuck, I did not see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> Saceration. The trees are whispering. It is the first clear thought the woman laying in the wash of the ocean 
has had since she came to. The insistent back and forth of the water is discordant with the sound of leaves rustling further up the beach. It should be more than loud enough to drown out that other greener noise, but it doesn't. Unable to move much beyond coughing the water from her lungs, all she can think about are those trees. She's fairly sure there is no wind. Her chin is barely off the sand, her neck muscles taut and on fire with the strain of keeping it out of the water, determined to stave off another bout of choking on the salty rinse, biceps shaking, head thumping. She needs to move. It takes her longer than she would have liked, but eventually she hauls herself over onto her back, every cut and bruise and wrenched muscles screaming as she does. She looks up at the sky, winded and blinking hard from the salt sting in her eyes and nose. Everything had seemed so bright when she'd first come to, but if it weren't for the fact that she can see the sun sitting at its zenith directly above her, she would have sworn the day was fast sinking into dusk. The trees are still whispering, and there is definitely no wind. On your feet, soldier! Despite everything, both the physical distance from home and the intervening years, she hears the familiar voice in her head as clear as day, and it makes her want to jump to attention as quickly as if he'd been there right beside her. Sir, yes, sir. He probably was. A man like her father wouldn't let something as trivial as death get in the way of bullying his only child. He'd haunt her just to spite her. He'd haunt her to win. She's pretty sure she's been in worse shape than this, though. Her arms and legs are weak, and she isn't sure she won't vomit once she gets upright, but given more time, maybe if she just lies down again for a few moments, just for a minute or two. Get up, idiot. His voice, always his voice. You were lucky you washed up alive from whatever trouble you got yourself into. Like as not, you should be dead. Go fuck yourself, Dad. She makes herself say the words. The colonel is dead, long gone and dust, but she cannot shake the old feeling that he will know somehow, and she has the scars to show what happened to those who were insubordinate in his household. Dead or alive. When she is ready, her breath finally just air, no more salt water in the mix, she stands. It takes her more than one attempt and, when she's finally something like steady on her feet, she becomes conscious of what feels like a sizable wound in her hairline. She touches it tentatively, probing as carefully as she can, and yes, there is a sticky evidence of what must surely be a lot of blood. Someone has dealt her a pretty good blow to the head, probably no longer than an hour or two ago. It makes her woozy, woozier, to touch it or even think about it, so instead she turns her attention to the beach. Frankly, after scanning its length as best she can, it doesn't make her feel any better. There is nothing and no one unexpected to be seen, which is good on one hand, but on the other, a whole lot of nothing means no help, and the unnatural silvery light of the prematurely dying day, cold and unwelcoming, makes her shiver. Unwillingly, she looks towards the susurrating tree line. It is dark in there, and worse, still, utterly still. Yet somehow, the trees are whispering, and there is no wind. Whatever happened to her, she knows without doubt that she is in a much worse predicament now. The bit in her brain that governs caution is screaming at her how not right this place is. It feels as though someone, or more likely something, is waiting for her in there. The beach is the proverbial frying pan. Still, risking the fire is better than being a corpse, right? Her father did not raise a coward, she reminds herself sharply, no matter that she always feels like one, especially now not knowing where she is or what she's either run or been pushed from. A quick survey of her pockets yields little, just a 
wet box of matches and... Wait, it can't be. But it is. It's a pocket knife. That's a whole lot better than nothing. She needs shelter and water or she is going to die here and quickly. No matter how much she dislikes the idea, the trees are her only salvation. Squaring her shoulders, reminding herself who it was that had seen to the colonel's eventual and horribly painful demise, his education had paid off after all. She takes a deep breath. She must have lost her boots and socks in the ocean, although of course she cannot recall how or when. But resolved, she starts to walk up the beach and towards the trees. She's only gone a matter of feet before she realises the sand beneath her bare toes is moving. She has the oddest feeling it is trying to warn her, the sand, to slip its message through her skin and into her bones, struggling to teach her the secret songs of that odd place. It is practically dancing beneath her, becomes increasingly frantic the closer she gets to the trees. It becomes harder to walk, harder and harder. The beach sucks at her feet like quicksand, seeming determined to stop her from entering the forest beyond. She tries to fight on, but finally falls to her knees a few feet from the tree line unable to pull herself free from the grabbing sand. Her punishment is immediate. She begins to sink. She tries to claw her way out, panic driving her on, skin and fingernails ripping from their beds, blood caking the grit of it to her fingers as she scrabbles at the sand. How is this happening? Her head and heart pound with the certainty that she is going to be swallowed whole the day still darkening around her, but she cannot gain purchase. She screams in frustration, but Debris just tries to fill the space, and she is coughing and spluttering and scrabbling at the shingle. And then, just when her arms are becoming too heavy, too slow, and she thinks she is going to meet her end in that sandy sarcophagus, she is suddenly free again. With a licentious pop, she is up on her feet and, despite the exhaustion, she is somehow running for the protection of the forest before whatever gave way on the beach can right itself and come for her again. The trees are still whispering, the sound more eager with every step that brings her closer to them, but her fear of the sand is absolute, so she does not stop, and still there is no wind. The moment she breaks through the tree line, the coolness of that dark harbour embraces her. Her heartbeat rises in her throat for a few ghastly moments, the rush of adrenaline getting in the way of her breath. But it calms more with every step she takes away from the beach and that dreadful sand, and eventually her chest catches up with her lungs. She takes a few more deep breaths, tests her hands to see how much they are shaking, and then wipes them as best she can on her soggy, sand-caked trousers. She is an absolute mess. But she is still alive. She won. As she begins to pick her way through the dark forest, she allows herself a small smile, nothing too smug. It is cool beneath the canopy, and the light seems as it should here. Why on earth had she been so afraid of it so short a time ago? Perhaps the whispering is running water somewhere up ahead. Frowning, she concentrates on the sound. She isn't entirely sure, but it certainly could be a stream. That would be some well-earned good news. She'll be able to drink, to clean her wounds and take stock. Yeah, she likes that idea. She likes it very much. For the first time since she opened her eyes to find herself washed up on the beach of that deserted place, bloody and bruised. She feels like everything will be okay. A hundred pairs or more of red eyes look down from the higher reaches of the forest canopy, rustling the leaves in their excitement, watching the woman's progress. She has come. She has come at last. They have been waiting for so long. From the moment she landed on their island, they have been able to smell the promise within her 
the sweetness of the blood that pumps beneath her skin, her muscles young and strong. They have been so patient, such good, obedient creatures. They didn't go looking for her, how could they? She just washed up of her own accord. Surely that must mean something. Surely she is here for them. They chattered to each other, the sound like leaves in a stiff breeze, all positing the same conclusion. She is the one. The trees whisper breathlessly, and still there is no wind. Fucking brilliant. Oh, oh wow. Fully, fully enjoyed that. You, you took us on such a journey. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> When you said when you say that you write odd stories, I think that's spot on um, and odd in the best <laughs> possible way because they're you know they're exciting, they move, they shift, the perception of what's happening changes, but it's always very cogent mm. and coherent. Mm. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that was that was a tour de force. Really, really good. I enjoyed that a lot. The, oh, good. Uh, I just really felt for her. Just bad <laughs> things kept happening. Oh no, you had to write. I think you're just both bad people. I don't. I don't want to be anymore. But the um, <laughs> we, we often have things that happen in both stories. I did not expect from Saturation two people to read stories one after the other where people's fingernails got ripped out of beds. Hell yeah, that's. Well, you gotta be careful. That's weird. <laughs> what else do you think of when you think of people whispering? <laughs> oh, do you know what? Now you said it <laughs> yeah. like that. You're right. <laughs> it, was, it was a um. It wasn't the first bit of description that that grabbed me, but it was it was the moment that I realised that you were going to keep doing this and keep grabbing me with your descriptions. Mm -hmm. um, it was the biceps shaking, and mm -hmm. it's very simple, but it's an odd muscle group. That yeah. it's an odd muscle to be shaking, um, and it you have to be completely exhausted. Like anyone that's like worked their arms to to look to failure knows mm -hmm. what that yeah. feels like, and it's fucking awful. Yeah. It's really not good. It's just yeah. it, it tells you the forearms are already blown out, the wrists are knackered, because if they're going, you know, your shoulders are already gone. Belt fucks, yeah, everything's yeah. gone. That's it. Everything yeah. is everything <laughs> is like that's last resort. <laughs> the um yeah. there was a ton of phrase right at the beginning that I actually wrote down because I liked it, which was the other greener noise. It's mm. very simple, but that that paints a word picture that I liked a lot. I ha I have a um I can't remember what it's called, where you see or taste something oh, that you're not actually yeah. see or tasting. What's it called? Oh. Sense, sense something. Yeah. I have that. Okay. So I, I can taste colour or I um, can hear the noise of something. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I, no, I, I just can't remember. There is, a, there is definitely uh, synesthesia. Synesthesia. That's it, yeah. There you yeah. go. I, I I can't remember which composer it is, but very famously they'd be conducting an orchestra, and they'd say things like "No, no, 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 bluer, bluer," and the orchestra mm. would never quite understand what they meant, but it was because they had <laughs> synesthesia. Yeah, you would, you would eventually learn, wouldn't you, if you were part of someone's orchestra? I think you, the were... new cellist. Yeah. What the fuck does that yeah. mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. the, tri the triangle person just knocking it repeatedly whenever they just, call for blue. <laughs> just means, uh, just means get piano, piano. <laughs> Actually, you said that, and then I saw the triangle, and it is blue. So there you, go. you get what I'm saying. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, there there were uh, a whole bunch of really cool stylistic devices that you were using there, which I which I really enjoyed. The the, the repetition of uh, there was whispering, but but no wind. That mm. is so unsettling. It was unsettling the first time you said it, and it was unsettling the last time you said <laughs> it. And every time in between, it did something a bit different for your story. <clears throat> right, and that, that's a, that's the perfect way to use repetition. I think, um, just yeah. absolutely well executed. I think I do love, I do love that conceit. I have to say, I like reading it and I like writing it. Yeah. You know, where you just uh, uh, an echo, and it it, it does tend to put people off a little. You know what I mean? Like uh, absolutely, yeah. the the unnerving yeah. nature of it. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, it, it, it little... does remind me of like a, like a like an acting exercise where you get people to say the same thing back to each other. Yes, mm. Nico, you probably know what this actually what the technical term for this is, but they, <laughs> you know, they, you know, one person will say it, and then the other person has to do something different with it to to advance yeah. the mm. story of the scene. And um, I always like it in that kind of situation, but in in a story where you're doing it 
deliberately, where the conceit is deliberate to build the tension and play with your descriptions, mm. it's very well executed. There was uh, there was a lot of lovely description that blurred the line between things that were living and things that weren't as well. Like mm -hmm. e everything felt like it could be actively trying to get her, but some things yeah. were just passively trying to get her. And I think that was, uh, I think it, it actually really helped with that befuddled state mm. that the character was in. Mm. It kind of helped you get into it. It was like the, the sound's moving; it's getting me and. Mm. You know, it, it meant that because things were framed in these interesting ways, you could never quite put it together, and it leaves mm. so much scope for for putting your own story in there. That's actually a, a great skill to have for short story writing. Thank you very much. Telling just enough to tell the story. That's, yeah, spot on. I do like stories that um, leave you wondering and having questions. Yes. I never used to. I used to always want, I'd be like, what, what, what happened? Who is this? And whatever. But as I've got older, I suppose, I don't know. Um, I, prefer, I prefer not to know so that I can put my story in the gaps. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when I'm reading something, then it's, it becomes my story like that. I think that's basically like a, a slightly higher, well, a, a, a lot more sort of like uh, elevated level of um, show don't tell, isn't it? Because yeah. if, if you overtell, yeah. people are like, okay, why am I reading this? Um, yeah. You've got to give people something to bite into. Um, and, I like and you that. You definitely did that. Yeah, for sure. So you don't actually, tell you're... rather than show don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> you actually, uh, Nico, you hit on something that was potentially my favorite bit of the story, which was the the fear inversion. Um, that happened with the sand and the trees. Yeah, uh, that just completely worked for me uh, in a, in a very big way. Like I feel I feel like I'm going to try and use something like that in my future writing because I really enjoyed this. If you know, if the trees are my enemy, then the sand is my friend. Oh wait, sand is not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the yeah. trees must be my. You know, it's that kind of assumption that you can yeah. fear really fear one thing at a time. Something um, has to be better yeah. than the current situation. Yeah, and the the slow way that you brought your audience into that by almost saying that the beach was helping her, was trying to warn her, and wait, wait, what? The fuck? Yeah, you know that <laughs> was really that was really cool. Um, fully, fully enjoyed that a lot. Um, yeah, really. Thank um, you. And then finally, I'm just, I feel like I'm just just blasting shotgun pellet after shotgun pellet of. Uh, of I'm enjoying form. it. Keep enjoying going. It. Keep going. <laughs> the, uh, the uh, you instantly characterize the father really well, mm. um, and then continue to build on it. So when it turned out that she was a patricide, that we were we were, I was it still surprised me because you were so blunt with that knowledge to your audience, but also mm. you already knew why she'd done it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So that that really worked for me, and then a bit and then a bit of description that uh, that I had to write down was licentious pop. Oh mm. yeah. Yeah, I do one. like a licentious pop. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Just on the uh, on the father referring to someone only by their rank is that tells you so much about yeah. a character, mm. especially from a daughter. That's like for for their child. I oh, yeah, the general. <laughs> it's like, whoa! Yeah. How bad <laughs> was it? <laughs> it's even worse when they're at like a slow, like like a lower rank though. Like, you know, <laughs> like they're, they're like the sergeant, <laughs> the sergeant major, or something. sergeant at arms. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I did. I did start with general or something like that, and then I thought, mm -hmm. no, he can't be, can he? He's got to be a a failed failed military man in some way or whatever, you know? Yeah, I mean, like when when I just in terms of like how like how ranks affect a reader, like for me, uh, a colonel is someone that is that is still on the front line. They are still commanding people in battle situations, mm. whereas a general can, you know, you do think armchair when you yeah. say general. Yeah. Um. Yeah, they're a bit more sort of like strategic and at the back and mm. in the command tent. Whereas I think a colonel is someone who can still be, you know, very much under fire. Um, Have to go over the top. That kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I think so. I was, I was like lieutenant. It's one that feels like it doesn't go anywhere, doesn't it? It's... Yeah, I think it helps that it's such an odd word, like the way that it's spelled. Yeah. It's, it's it one of the few that I will concede to the Americans. It, where does the F come from? <laughs> it comes from Britain. <laughs> <laughs> um so I, I said i was done but i'm actually not uh the uh the <laughs> i i wrote down that um you actually 
the bit at the end from the from the the split perspective um gave me and and just before that happens well basically as soon as she enters the forest um i was getting strong murkwood vibes you know that kind of like mind bend of mm. yeah, yeah. happening um yeah but but without it being oh this is murkwood like it, it you just evoked that same kind of disorientating misleading uh mm. forest and that really worked for me yeah oh good like as i said as i said right at the start i felt like that, that was a tour de force i thoroughly enjoyed that thank you for telling it to me thank you thank you very much oh going last is always <laughs> shit nope it's always shit oh uh, oh did you expect me to bring one yeah oh yeah. no i didn't, I didn't <laughs> you're, on, you're on the spot now Chosen don't tell one. lies <laughs> <laughs> i like that <laughs> it's so aggressive <laughs> get going boy <sighs> Uh, heads up warning everyone, it's poetry that doesn't rhyme. Let's see if it Yay! works. Yay! I love it! Susuration. The stage awaits my presence. It will do so for some time, as there are three yet left in front of me. When you watch these on the internet, things move quickly, thanks to the edit, but in this moment now, I seem to wait forever. I had not imagined, truly, that I would be summoned here to do a TED Talk. I feel I know him well enough to call him Ted, not Theodore, or Edward, whichever is his true name. So I wait to talk for Ted, and the audience he gathered, someone up there now is speaking something about particles. I don't know about particles, except that in your food there is a set amount of particles, of rat shit, that the government considers to be passable. Uh, to me, I'd say that 0% of rat shit is the right amount, <laughs> maybe even less than that, but... I am not a lawmaker, and I don't know of particles, and miss my chance to learn of all the things they have to offer because I was thinking about rat shit. Applause occurs, so I join in. Clap for the talk of particles. That scientist has smashed it. Now the two in front of me can go. One of them flicks through her notes, the other one is watching memes on YouTube. Will they talk about memes? Will Ted be told of memes in Deep Law? Memes can die, as do we all. Maybe he will speak of the lifespan of the common meme. Really put the fear up them. Oh shit, I've missed the topic of the speaker. When she walked on stage, my mind was still stuck on the meme thing. It's something about feminism, or maybe just on gender, but I can't tell what perspective that they're trying to evoke. Ted wouldn't be misogynistic. Not good old Ted, or Theodore, or Edward. The crowd is whooping. The point must have been a good one. But again, I missed it. This time, deep in thought about some entity named Ted, with transphobic worldviews and a trench coat for some reason. But I can fix him. He's uneducated. That's why we all come here, for poor Ted. To calmly give our talks and fill him in on worldly basics. Oh, I just assume Ted's gender. Shit, it's easy to get complacent. And end up the baddie. Even in your own imagination, there's a word that's changed a lot like bad or sick or fat they've gained new meaning so now baddie means someone you'd have sex with good looking fierce instead of someone in the cartoons on saturday morning trying to turn the world's forests into wood chips to power their machine that propels their super evil robot that the hero has to shit applause again i missed the whole damn talk i'll have to catch them later except i didn't get their name and that is going to make it awkward when I get back to the green room. Oh, please don't leave yet, whoever you are. I loved your talk on something that you did this afternoon. Could you do it all again right now? Because I'm still uncertain on the parts from minute one to roughly where it finished. Break a leg, the guy in front of me says, a smile and a wink as he steps up. I'm going to pay attention. And he starts to talk about the correlation between men and beasts, the animals we represent or represent us in our dreams or spirit animals or why we call each other dog or bitch or something i'm quite lost i'm distracted by his polo shirt which look quite normal over here but underneath those blinding lights its luminescence knows no bounds his teeth are on that same line too and every time he grins it's like a fucking lighthouse on the stage i'm just like shy i realize t-shirt with no slogan on because the lawyers have decreed that someone might be watching and you can't look like you're a fan of anything or the people who own naruto or star wars or whatever top i'd yank to wear would be straight on the phone and want a million quid because they owned the shirt design but i paid for it so it's mine is that not how these things are meant to work doesn't make much sense to me Primark are not going to be braying for my blood because one XL grey t-shirt for a couple quid was dragged to be on TED Talks. Theodore will back me up. Or Edward. 
if that is his name. And shit, there it goes, the same applause. Like bookends on each of the talks. One to welcome, one to bid farewell. It pulls me back to waiting to go on and trying to recall what the hell the last one was about. Because I'm next, and people will forget what I was on about, I reckon, if they're anything like me, and get distracted easily. Oh, I'm on, I realise. I step onto the stage, expecting my applause, a smattering at least. Politeness indicates that this is when you do the clapping, but not one pair starts to meet. The hands stay separate in their seats, but whispering and muttering instead become a bubbling brook and start to flood the stage that Edward, Theodore, or Ted has set up for all of us to use, so I panic and I start my talk, but everyone is open-mouthed. I try to think of them without their clothes, a trick I heard of on TV. It doesn't work because a lady at the front is quite my type, and when I start to think of her <laughs> undressed, I think of the second speech in Feminist and how I'm wrong to picture breasts on holy ground like TED Talk stage, and whispering begins again, and I can't help but feel a nerve that twitches in the upper brain and tells me something's very wrong, and I'm not focused on my talk. It autopilots out of me. And now they know my expertise and I say thank you for your time and start to leave and no one claps. And I walk back to where they had the drinks and snacks and plan my chat with the feminist because her one seemed interesting. And only then I realise as I reach to my pocket to remove the notes I didn't need because my talk was memorised, my trousers are not sitting right. <laughs> And frantically, I feel the situation and I die inside. A horror overcomes me. I was talking up there 12 minutes and no one clapped. No one learned a single thing about our new initiatives on solar energy and how we might save the world because they were all distracted. I did the whole talk with my cock out. <laughs> <laughs> that was fucking brilliant. I was glad you liked it, man. <laughs> was it your intention to give us both the nervous breakdown? Is that <laughs> like... <laughs> Possibly. I don't really know. I, I'm not even really sure where it came from, but it just happened really fast. <laughs> I wrote down, we're in for some wanky jokes. Uh, like, after the first Ted Theodore bit. <laughs> And then and then laughed for the rest of it. So it was really, really yeah. well executed. It was lovely. Oh, uh, I really it. enjoyed it. I did. I really enjoyed it too. It was awesome. I was trying not to laugh too loudly. Oh, you know, <laughs> you're, you're allowed to. It makes me know I haven't just gone mad and written something really weird. I don't think it means that at all. Because <laughs> you definitely oh, no. did. You're not, a, you're not a reliable witness. <laughs> Not at all. I fully meant that rat shit thing, but you know that's real. Yeah, yeah I've heard that before. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Actually, like, I I've actually never read that it's fact. It, it, is that one of the ones that actually might be apocryphal, or do you think it actually is a hundred percent? No, I don't know. We need a. We've got any rat shit experts in the audience? Some if you can write in, shit, yeah. Yeah. a rat fat shit. Gonna... Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I'm vegan. That sort of shit. <laughs> that, that exact kind of shit. They always have to mention it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> we will uh, allow it. Was, there was one rhyme. Uh, yeah, there. I think there's a couple of half rhymes in there as well. That snuck in. Yeah, I uh, really, I, I liked it. I think I thought the at any point it, for a start, it had like great rhythm, great flow, and then I found that I was looking for them. I think potentially because I've heard quite a lot of your poetry before. Yeah. Um, but. The whole thing flowed wonderfully. That you know, uh, that internal monologue style of um, storytelling that you have normally translated yeah. into a more poetic form worked really well. Um, mm. The you captured that rote process of these these TED talks because I mean I haven't I haven't listened to a TED talk in like three years now. They like yeah. Yeah. they 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 were really good when they first came out. They felt like they were really good. And then it sort of became its its own thing, didn't it? That people started to poke mm. fun at because everyone did it the same way. Yeah. And you really captured that rote process of just churning out things to, to illuminate Ted. <laughs> Which you do need to do in a kind of poetic form because of yeah. the rhythm. Yes. To like just endlessly keep banging at us, you know, oh yes. You feel the anxiety and the you know. I think that's like inevitability. 
yeah, yeah the, the manic nature i think only yeah. works with the rhythm i think if you take it out it would just be a very odd collection of words <laughs> it'd just be a story about your willy hanging out that would well, work. That's true. all it was really <laughs> that's probably not too many of those already i think <laughs> <laughs> no yeah um, i've seen a lot of there's a lot of really beautiful poetry floating around on the internet obviously and some mm. really great performances that I've, uh, that I've seen a lot of people talking about gender identity and racial identity. And so it does feel a bit weird to sort of do a big comedy thing using that same style. But it's, I'm, I am fascinated by this kind of uh, characterized poetry. I think it's a really cool art form. Mm. So I am, I'm glad that it's turning up more and more on the, yeah. on the web at the moment. There's a couple of um, poems in my collection. We all have teeth that are kind of like that. Okay. There's one about Red Riding Hood, but it's not about Red Riding Hood. Mm -hmm. And uh, one about um, an interesting night out at a nightclub as well. And it's the, the sort of thing, again, that you to tell it as a story would have been fine. Yeah. But using the poetic form... And quite a rigid poetic form, I think it was for that one. It, it it just gives it that something extra. Yeah. You know that little punch that you need to make it different. So. Uh, it's it's such an interesting skill, isn't it, to to write this kind of this kind of poetry? Like, uh, I I actually really suck at uh, writing rhyming poetry. So, mm. and and people don't tend to like non-rhyming poetry. I find. Um, or some people do, obviously, but uh, I, yeah, I, absolute tour de force, like re really, really good. W were you inspired by yeah. Ron at all? Uh, he is one of the people that uh, that I I think it's uh, seeing that I, I shared it with you, didn't I? He he, he read a poem about his uh, his wiener and it it not being a, a villain. Um, and I think it's having seen that and watched few, through it a few times, it's possibly got my algorithm pulling me more poets. So who was that? Uh, Theo Vaughn is a comedian. Okay, I'll look for him. Mm. I've written it down on my pad now. Uh, or would you now? He is wildly unhinged. <laughs> I like my four way. shit. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> More unhinged, the better. Overrated hinges. <laughs> you, sort of, you sort of see him on podcasts sometimes with other American comedians and he'll say something. And they just do that like wacky like double take when he says something. <laughs> yeah. It's it's phenomenal. He's, he's an absolute genius. Just perfect deadpan <laughs> delivery on everything. Yeah. That's because it, it's it's not deadpan delivery. That's just him. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just him being him. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Um, so Chloe, I think we should uh bring the bring the stories section to a close here. Um, so could you let everyone know where they could get hold of your stuff and where they should follow you and. And all these bits and pieces. and Indeedy. Let me just find my little notes. Uh, my website is um, www.chloeyates.com. And uh, I'm on, I'm actually be on that X thing. Is it X now? Twitter? Uh, yeah, I, I sort of interchange. I often say Twitter and then say X afterwards like a fool. I'm just, I don't, I'm, I've never really used Twitter a lot and yeah. I'm e using it even less now. I mainly use Instagram and I'm at Shlooby, which is S H L O O B E E. Boxspirit.co.uk as well. They have some of my stuff on there for free. Should you like it? Plus, Fox Spirit are amazing. So, wonderful. Right. Well, that's it. Definitely check those out, everyone, because uh, as, you, <laughs> as, you just, as you just heard, she's an absolute wizard with stories. So, Join us for the next one and we'll do some uh, questions. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? 
For rich ginger tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ula La Al Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? <laughs> How do you come up with that shit, man?